what should I do now? Ludmilla had no desire to chase after Fluda Paradine, but she also had no idea what to do with the pile of books he had picked out for her. After flipping through each of them, it became abundantly clear that she had no hope of translating them on her own. She carefully placed the books into the infinite haversack on her left hip before investigating her surroundings. Upon doing so, the first thing she realized was that she was lost. It was a novel, if unwelcome, feeling. That rangers never got lost was considered common sense, but it only applied to natural environments or at least the outdoors. Even a window would allow one to orient themselves. The great library of Ashabonapol, however, was a completely enclosed and artificial environment with a layout too vast to immediately commit to memory. It didn't help that she had been following Fluda around the entire time. She wandered around the wing until she came across the animated model of the ship they had passed on the way in. The thing still didn't make much sense to her. Some of its sails were angled in such a way that they would be below the waterline if it was a seagoing vessel. Was it one of the flying ships that the beacon at Eastwatch was supposed to attract? Her eyes were drawn to the weaponry mounted around the ship. A pair of ballistae were directed to its port and starboard sides, and another was mounted on the bow. The bolts loaded onto the siege engines had chains attached to them, so they might have been used for interdiction or boarding actions. Parapet-like protrusions along the length of the hull were manned by figures in robes, suggesting stations where magic casters might conduct ranged skirmishes with distant foes. I knew it was a good idea. We should have added those to our barges. In the event of an attack, the bare decks of their cargo vessels didn't afford their defenders any protection. Her friends insisted it would be fine since each barge was operated by an elder lich and two death warriors, but one could never be sure if that was enough. Ludmilla moved on from the model, keeping the balcony to her left in hopes that it would lead her back to the entrance of the wing. Thankfully, it did, and a few minutes later she found herself at a desk manned by a dark-robed figure. Her breath caught as her eyes fell over a familiar visage, but then she calmed down again as soon as she realized it wasn't the same person. Is there something I can help you with? The speaker was an undead being who was in many ways similar to the Sorcerer King in appearance. It had the same height and build, and his black robes fell over its frame in a familiar way. Indeed, many would mistake it for the sorcerer king himself, so Ludmilla was somewhat proud that she could immediately tell the difference. Yes, as a matter of fact, Ludmilla replied. I am Baroness Ludmilla Zaradnik, and his majesty the sorcerer king brought me here to conduct some research. Someone helped me pick out these books, but I'd like to ensure that they're what I'm looking for. Is that something you can help me with? A bony finger came up to tap the surface of the counter. Ludmilla pulled out her books and stacked them in a small pile. Thank you for the help, Ludmilla said. Might I know your name? Aurelius. It sounds like a name from the theocracy. Maybe he's a faithful soul from the past who was granted the opportunity to serve for eternity. A kindred soul, perhaps? Ludmilla smiled. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Aurelius. Aurelius picked up the first book and read its title aloud. Armageddon, The Nuclear Holocaust of the European Arcology War. A. Kessler's Curse, The Consequences of International Conflicts in Low Earth Orbit. Plutocratic Virtue and the Stewardship of Humanity. Eco-Terrorism in the Late 21st Century. Volo's Guide to the North. The Conservation Fallacy. Morally Bankrupt, The Rise and Fall of the East Pacific Eco-Socialist Regime. Aragorn and Legolas Other Adventures in Middle-Earth. Food Security and the Masses. Detecting the Onset of Luddite Disorder. Bushwalker's Guide. Crimes Against Humanity, Inuit Atrocities Against Miners in Greenland. Ludmilla jotted down the titles, trying to make sense of what any of them meant. A good quarter of the terms used were unknown to her. Only a few seemed even vaguely related to what she was looking for, though the titles of some of the others seemed interesting. She would have to take a look at them at a later date. Out of these books, Ludmilla asked, which ones are related to Rangers? Aurelius went back and flipped through each book. In the end, 
He identified eco-terrorism in the late 21st century, Aragorn and Legolas' other adventures in Middle-earth, Bushwalker's Guide, and Crimes Against Humanity, Inuit atrocities against miners in Greenland as being relevant to her search. Now, all she had to do was figure out how to translate them. Out of curiosity, Ludmilla asked, are there any language aids available in this library? No. I see. Well, thank you for your kind assistance, Mr. Aurelius. Ludmilla inclined her head respectfully before leaving the wing. She made her way back to the teleportation gate to the ninth floor, where Miss Delta and Miss Sita were still stationed. Woodlouse. Miss Sita waved her sleeves above her head. Woodlouse, Miss Delta said. Miss Del. She's you is fine. Miss she's you, Miss Sita, I hope the knight finds you well. Would you happen to know where His Majesty the Sorcerer King went? Lord Ines went back up through the teleportation gate with Lord Mayor and Lady Aura, Miss Sita replied. He didn't say where he was going, is that so? Ludmilla said, I suppose I should get back to the sixth floor, then. By the way, are either of you going to be fighting in this tournament? Yup. Miss Sita said, we are fighting in the afternoon. I'll be sure to come and watch, Ludmilla said. Good luck to the both of you. She entered the teleportation gate to the ninth floor, where the Sorcerer King's household staff eyed her curiously as she made her way down the long hallway with its many trophies. Though she knew many of the maids due to them having duty shifts in e Rantle, none of them came over to speak with her. When she arrived on the sixth floor, traces of the dawn could be found on the eastern horizon, or at least she assumed that it was the eastern horizon. Day and night could be exchanged on a whim, but she saw little reason to make things purposely confusing. The festival grounds were still empty, so she headed back to Lord Mayor and Lady Aura's house, strolling along the shores of a small lake on the way there. Outside of her tent, she found Lady Aura already up and about, brushing the glistening scales of a huge reptilian beast with a broom. The dark elf ranger looked comically small beside the creature, which was as long as an adult frost dragon and likely more than five times the mass. It opened a single eye to look lazily in her direction, but didn't otherwise react to her presence. Good morning, Lady Aura, Ludmilla said. Good morning. Lady Aura replied brightly, how was the library? I can't even begin to describe how impressed I was with the place, my lady, Ludmilla replied. The only problem is that I can't read any of the script used in its books. Speaking of which, would you mind helping me transcribe some of these books? Lady Aura's broom stopped moving. The reptilian creature made a displeased sound. Ah, maybe? The broom started moving again, how big are these books? In response, Ludmilla pulled out one of the tomes. Lady Aura wrinkled her nose. I guess I could help you with some of it she said, let me take care of Iris here first. Is Iris one of your companions, my lady? Ludmilla asked. Yep. She's sluggish in the morning, so it's the best time to give her a scrub. She resembles the raptors that I saw in the blister. Lady Aura looked over at her. They have raptors there? The reports didn't say anything about that. I'm certain that I mentioned them in my report to the Grand Marshal, my lady. Ludmilla said. Maybe they were excluded because they didn't represent much of a threat. Gur, I wish I knew earlier. The Empire's moving in, they might have hunted them all down already. Did you get any for yourself? For myself? No, my lady. I already have a companion, so the thought didn't cross my mind, while she may have convinced Viscount Brennenthal to be more mindful of the natural state of his new fief, she was under no illusion that the other imperial knights would show the same consideration. The vast majority of them were reliant on seneschals dispatched by the imperial administration to manage their territories anyway, and there was no reason to believe that they wouldn't immediately initiate the development of productive land. As they did so, the native species of the blister would be slowly pushed back until their habitat was finally gone and they went extinct. Is there some place in the Sorcerer's Kingdom where we might harbor some survivors? Ludmilla asked. Like another jungle? Not at the moment. We have some space on the sixth floor, 
but there won't be any hot jungles like the blister in the sorcerer's kingdom until we conquer some. I was thinking that you could just bring some to Warden's Vale anyway. Would that be wise, my lady? Suitable environment aside, I'm not sure whether we should introduce foreign species so haphazardly. Why not? Lady Aura shrugged, you are basically building an ecology for your capital from scratch. Raptors would make good pets for your rangers, too. Can they be domesticated? I suppose they could occupy the same niche as small predators like cats. They have the intelligence of magical beasts, so they're even better. You just have to teach them how things work in your territory. What they're allowed to hunt and so on. I can't say I've heard of anyone introducing wild animals to civilization like that, Ludmilla said. As much as I'd like to save them, I can't have them harming my subjects in the process. Maybe a few packs could be tamed and brought along with their eggs or something. The raptors in the blister kept their distance from the imperial army, so she would have to figure out what they were like before committing to anything. Since the adventurer guild was there, she might be able to have them investigate in her stead. On a related note, my lady, how do you think the blister will change? The empire will push development in the region, but the Viridian Dragon Lord is also gone. As Dame Verilin has demonstrated, dragons can influence the elemental balance in their domains. It'll get less toxic, I guess? Lady Aura said, the plants and animals will stop being poisonous and venomous. Of course, that also means the Empire will find a whole bunch of rare materials vanishing under their noses. Sucks for them. She was of the same opinion. Then again, it might not matter to the Empire and they were probably even expecting it due to their experiences with past expansion. To them, it was merely something that came with a successful wilderness conquest. The blister would gradually become less hostile, slowly transforming into the pastoral basin that its conquerors desired. If anything, it might be the Sorcerer's Kingdom's Adventurer Guild's reputation at stake. They would report their findings only to have things change after doing so. Is Lord Mayor around? Ludmilla asked, this is probably something we should let the Adventurer Guild know about. He's probably lazing around in his room, Lady Aura answered. One second, I'll call him. Lady Aura grasped the acorn amulet hanging from her neck for a moment, then resumed tending to Iris. Her companion's tail waved back and forth contentedly as the dark elf ranger brushed her fangs. After Lady Aura was done, she looked over at the tree house with a frown before grasping her amulet again. That lazy little, I'm going to go get him. Shall I meet you at the tent, my lady? Ludmilla asked, I'll see what I can put together for breakfast. Sure. Muted shouting came from the tree house as Ludmilla went around it to check on her tent. With the way the three elf maids treated her, she half expected it to be a pile of ashes by the time she returned. Fortunately, it looked untouched and the tent flap was still secured. She rummaged around in her infinite haversacks, sorting through her remaining provisions before settling on breakfast. Pulling out a small shovel, she went to dig a fire pit. A nice little blaze was already going by the time Lady Aura dragged Lord Mayor out of their home. Good morning, Lord Mayor, Ludmilla smiled at his sleepy expression. Un. What's for breakfast? Lady Aura asked. Ludmilla produced several wooden skewers, followed by a shroud of sleep. She unwrapped the magic item to reveal several fish the length of her forearm. Trout from the Katza River, Ludmilla answered. I had originally intended to have the local chef prepare something, but cooking them over a campfire feels better when we're gathered like this. She had already cleaned and salted the fish before storing them away, so all that was left was to grill them over the fire. Lord Mayor and Lady Aura settled onto the blankets she had set out for them, staring at the flames as they waited for their food. Do you still like food? Lady Aura asked. I would say that I do. Ludmilla answered. I isn't that weird? Lord Mayor said, undead don't get hungry, and most undead that do eat stuff don't eat, ah, uh, normal stuff. Vampires drink blood. Ghouls eat flesh. A whole bunch just drain their victims with touch attacks. Yeah, Lady Aura nodded. Shiltir can eat regular food, but she says that the taste is faded or dull. 
Well, Lud Miller said, I, for one, am happy that I still experience life as myself. I've thought about this in the past and it's likely due to my being a revenant. I manifested as myself, or at least what I believe to be myself, doesn't that mean you'll change as your perception of yourself changes? Lord Mayor asked. That is a very good question, Ludmilla answered. One that will probably require someone else to help figure out. I'd like to think that I'd only change as much as anyone else would. Being eternally unchanging would also be undesirable. The latter honestly worried her more. Being unable to change meant that she would eventually be nothing more than a relic of a bygone era. She would be doomed to watch the world leave her behind, or maybe she would fight to prevent it from happening. Either way, it was a fate that she fervently hoped wouldn't come to pass. But don't you want some things to never change? Lord Mayor asked, things that you like, or stuff that you think is good. I can certainly empathize with that sentiment, Ludmilla answered, but clinging to the past is never a good thing. The cost of doing so will eventually catch up with anyone who tries. We are the keepers of our own past, remaining stagnant may seem like a good way to preserve things, but, in reality, it's a guarantee that they will eventually be lost. MMH, this is hard. Lady Aura's fingers went to the timekeeping device on her wrist. But places like Nazarick are made to last forever, she said. I thought that meant things could stay the same forever. What does His Majesty have to say about that? Ludmilla asked. Is he content with staying in Nazarick under this notion that it will last forever? No, Lord Mayor answered. He went out to see what the world was like and founded the Sorcerer's Kingdom. He's always cautious about stuff and tells us to be careful. That's right, Ludmilla said. I also know he cares for you a great deal, but does he lock you inside your house or use magic to keep you the same forever? No. Lord Ein says that he wants to see us learn and grow. He sends us outside to do stuff, too. See? Ludmilla smiled, you don't have to hear it from me, his majesty has already shown you the way forward. Ludmilla checked to see if the fish were cooked before handing the twins their skewers. They wiped their eyes before taking their meals, tearing into them with a relish. She planted another two skewers over the fire before taking her time with her own. Mayor, Lady Aura said around a mouthful of food, Ludmilla said that the expedition needs to be careful about what they report on their survey. E-expedition? The Adventurer Guild expedition to the blister. Oh, why? The ecology of the area will change with the removal of the green dragons in the area, Ludmilla said. We don't want people claiming that our survey work is shoddy because of it. At the least, our work should note that this will happen, will they really complain? Lord Mayor asked, Countess Wagner said that we're giving them a super good deal. It's an extremely generous offer, Ludmilla answered but it would still result in a stain on the reputation of our adventurer guild. People will tell others that our rates are cheap, but our work reflects those cheap rates. That's not good, okay, I'll figure something out. They ate in silence as the landscape brightened around them. After Lady Aura finished off her second fish, she used a trooper's towel to clean her hands before settling more comfortably into her blanket. So, she said, what books did you find? I managed to get Fluda Paradigm to find a few for me, Ludmilla replied. Speaking of which, you all abandoned me. I it can't be helped, Lady Aura protested. He's smelly and annoying and crazy. I wouldn't have been surprised to find out you tossed him over a balcony railing. I don't casually attack people like that, Ludmilla frowned. Anyway, I had a gentleman named Aurelius check through our findings and he narrowed things down to these four books. She reached into her infinite haversack and pulled out eco-terrorism in the late 21st century, Aragorn and Legolas' other adventures in Middle-earth, Bushwalker's Guide, and Crimes Against Humanity, Inuit Atrocities Against Miners in Greenland. Lady Aura made a face at the thickness of the last one. I'm kind of interested in what you're researching, Lady Aura said, but did you have to pick out such a huge book? I don't mind, Ludmilla said it just means that whoever wrote it had a lot to share. That being said, I'm unsure if I understand these titles correctly. 
All but one of them doesn't seem to have anything to do with rangers. Lady Aura stretched out a hand. Ludmilla handed her eco-terrorism in the late 21st century. Let's see, in the late 2060s, extremists around the world banded together to form anti-progress militia groups. Dubbing themselves rangers, their terrorist activities disrupted global supply chains, causing trillions in damage to industry and logistical infrastructure. This barbaric campaign, which the public likened to the second coming of the Mongols, lasted nearly two decades and resulted in the deaths of three billion innocent civilians before international peacekeeping efforts put an end to their atrocities. They sound kind of cool, Lord Mayor said. I'm not so sure about them sounding cool, Ludmilla frowned, but what do they have to do with rangers aside from using the term for their organization? I don't know, Lady Aura said. Hmm, it looks like there are sections describing how they fought and stuff. Maybe that's the important part? If you please, my lady. The dark elf ranger cleared her throat. Operationally, the ranger's activities could be divided into three main strategies. The most prevalent was known as rewilding, which involved the destruction of primary industries such as farms, mines, and fishing fleets. New urban developments were also targeted, creating a housing crisis leading to overcrowding and the growth of slums in established urban centers. Thus, responsibility for the squalid conditions and uncontrollable epidemic waves of that period can be placed squarely on the activities of the eco-terrorists. The higher-profile strategies involved the destruction of port facilities and acts of piracy and banditry along major transport arteries. Fertilizer storage and fuel depots were a favored target, as well as unmonitored stretches of railway, highway, and bottlenecks in shipping lanes. Use of improvised explosive devices and converted commercial drones to carry out these attacks was widespread, with agents masquerading as corporate employees sent to target higher security facilities. What's a drone? Ludmilla asked. Who knows? Lady Aura shrugged. Isn't there a job class archetype that uses them? Lord Mayor said one of the ones that uses machines. Machines being used to attack logistical facilities? She would have to keep an eye out for that. Finally, Lady Aura continued, the greatest acts of terrorism were committed against refineries, factories, and other large-scale corporate facilities. Most notably, several thousand corporate executives were assassinated throughout the campaign in senseless acts of savagery. The last organized acts of eco-terrorism were conducted in the 2080s, though sporadic incidents continued to occur beyond the turn of the century. Why was this campaign conducted in the first place? Ludmilla asked. Ah. Lady Aura flipped to the front of the book, it says something about the eco-terrorists being a cult that subscribed to the Anthropocene hoax. Their actions were supposedly meant to save the environment, but, in their foolish ignorance, they destroyed it instead. Ludmilla looked back and forth between Lady Aura and Lord Mayor. Does that sound right to you? Ludmilla said, it sounded like they were trying to stop industrial expansion to preserve nature. Why would that instead result in its destruction? I don't know. Lady Aura scanned the pages, okay, this part talks about why the eco-terrorists were wrong. It says that, because people are a part of nature, Anything that people do is natural behavior. The actions of the rangers came at a crucial juncture wherein people, and thus nature, were trying to gain the ability to spread itself beyond the planet. They had one shot, the eco-terrorists ruined it and doomed everyone. I still find it difficult to believe, Ludmilla crossed her arms. Can people ruin the entire world? Why not develop magics to counteract the damage? When did the events described in the book even happen? It mentioned the 2060s and 2080s, so did that mean it happened two millennia after the birth of the world? A time so long ago that the world had restored the damage and left no trace of the doomed civilization mentioned in the book? Since it was in the Great Library, maybe the Sorcerer King came from that era, meaning that he was wise and ancient beyond what the temples of the Six imagined. Maybe magic came later, Lord Mayor suggested or maybe they just didn't figure it out in time. I don't think the book says anything about everyone dying, Lady Aura said. 
Maybe the survivors just stuck it out until nature restored itself. See? Love Miller said, you said it, too. If nature came back after this society collapsed, then the assertion that the rangers were wrong is flawed. I if we have more information, Lord Mayor said, maybe we could get a better idea of what happened. Lud Miller picked up the thinnest book, Aragorn and Legolas Other Adventures in Middle-earth, and handed it to Lord Mayor. The title suggested that it occurred at a midpoint in history. Lord Mayor flipped open the cover, his eyes moving back and forth across the page. What does it say? Lady Aura asked. Lord Mayor flipped to the next page without answering. Lady Aura shrugged off her blanket and came over to look over her brother's shoulder. Her eyes slowly grew wide and she went red to the tips of her ears before she snatched the book from Lord Mayor and smacked him in the back of the head with it. Ow! Oh. Lord Mayor cried as his hands came up to shield himself, W.H. what was that for, big sis? You are not allowed to read this kind of book. Lady Aura told him. What is it? Ludmilla asked. It's dangerous, Lady Aura said as she stuffed the book into her inventory, I'll be holding onto this for safekeeping. Eh anyway, let's see what's in the next one. I wonder if there's an alternative account of these events, Ludmilla said. The author of this book clearly has something against these people. I know, right? Lady Aura frowned, why do the villains keep losing? This isn't realistic. I suppose this just means that propaganda is a thing wherever or whenever one finds themselves. Crimes against humanity, Inuit atrocities against miners in Greenland chronicled a conflict in a land once covered in ice. When that ice melted away, it revealed the largest source of rare materials in the world. This, of course, drew the attention of foreign interests. The inhabitants of Greenland, the Inuit, at first welcomed foreign companies as an economic boon. When those companies refused to stop breaking the protective regulations limiting their industrial activities, however, the Inuit suspended their activities. Unfortunately, the foreigners refused to give up their foothold. To resist the local authorities, the companies at first hired powerful mercenary groups for protection. Then, eventually, what was termed the international community sent their armed forces to stabilize the region and protect the world's economic welfare. However, the hopelessly outmatched natives of Greenland didn't give up. Instead of facing the forces raiding their homeland directly, they fought a guerrilla war using their Arctic Rangers a type of ranger specialized for operations in frozen climes. While the Inuit and their equipment were alien to Ludmilla, there weren't even any descriptions of their race included in the account, the tactics that they employed were familiar enough. They targeted the vulnerable aspects of any invading force, supply lines, depots, and the camps housing the civilian experts stealing resources. It was similar to how any tribe or frontier territory would deal with dangerous raids and migrations. I wonder if anyone in their right mind would believe the narrative presented alongside this record, Lud Miller said. You are reading it the same way, right? These Inuit are trying to defend their home against raiders who are after the rare materials on their land. Rare Earths I beg your pardon, my lady. The book says rare earths, not rare materials. What's the difference? Is the term specifically used for rare materials extracted from the ground? Who knows? Anyway, I think I know why the defenders keep losing. Why is that? Lady Aura lay the book across her lap, pointing a finger at a paragraph. Their bills are all messed up, she said. They're rangers, but they use guns. Rangers and gunners might occupy a similar niche in combat, but they're completely different archetypes. You should be either one or the other and level up from there. Also, their pet choice sucks, didn't it say they used some breed of dog? Lud Miller said, it's not an uncommon choice for foresters in our region. The dogs in this book seem like regular beasts to me, Lady Aura told her. They had better choices, like these polar bears. Why would you get a dog when you could have a bear? They even have aquatic capabilities and the raiders are coming from the sea. Ludmilla nodded along with Lady Aura's reasoning. The way that polar bears were described, she was certain that they could easily tear open the hulls of the invaders' ships. 
since the invaders seemed to be regular humans, they would quickly die in the cold seas around Greenland. Our Tilda Lady Aura sighed, I hope I can get a bear soon. The ones in the great forest of Tob aren't any good. What do you think of the justifications provided in this book? Ludmilla asked, for whatever reason, the raiders keep getting propped up as the heroes of the story. That's just what heroes are like, I guess, Lady Aura answered. They run in, screaming about you being the bad guy, then they kill you and take your stuff. The villains are the good guys, if you ask me. Her sentiment was probably one shared by any society being invaded for land and resources. In the case of Greenland, a huge international coalition had branded the natives defending their land as the ones in the wrong. They were labelled as any number of things, most of which Lud Miller had no idea about, but the phrasing made the Inuit out to be monsters who spread suffering across the world. Sometimes, they were framed as poor, ignorant people who clung to superstition and outdated traditions that denied business opportunities and a better life for future generations. Other times, they were violent cultists driving up prices for various goods and negatively impacting the quality of life for people around the world. The untapped resources that they denied the raiders access to represented countless jobs, so they were logically also plunging countless innocent people into poverty. Between the first book and this one, she could see why Fluda Paradine had picked them out for her. The Baharuth Empire harbored the same broad sentiment when it came to opponents of imperial expansion. Ranger and Druid were synonymous with enemy if they didn't support the empire's development mandates. How would the Sorcerer's Kingdom approach a scenario like this? Ludmilla asked. We destroy the invaders, Lady Aura answered. People who come in thinking that they have any right to your stuff should just do the world a favor and die. That's good to know, Ludmilla said. I think I've had my fill of this book, what's the last one about? Lady Aura closed the book on her lap and picked up Bushwalker's Guide. She gave it a glance before looking across the fire at Ludmilla. This is a job class promotion item, Lady Aura told her. It gives you the Bushwalker job class. It sounds ranger-ish, Ludmilla said. It's a ranger prestige class specialized in brushland environments. What does it add on top of the basic ranger benefits? I don't have it myself, so I'm not sure. The details are probably inside, but I don't want to accidentally use the item by reading it. What a fearsome item! Ludmilla wrenched her gaze away from the book. People could accidentally have their builds contaminated just by looking at the thing. Was it in reality a vicious trap posing as a treasure in Ashabonapole? Is there a safe way to access the information within, my lady? Mare's been learning about that stuff for the Adventurer Guild. Mare Hay. A few meters away from Lady Aura, Lord Mare was dozing in his blanket. Maybe two fish was too much for him. Mare. MMH. Lord Ines. Lady Aura picked up a pebble and flicked it at her brother. The tiny projectile flew straight into Lord Mare's ear. Hya! Lord Mare squealed, and not the ears, Lord Ain A. Eh? The dark elf druid peered groggily at them, then shied away from his sister's cross look. Ah, ah, M Mountain Pass Materials Corporation. We gave up on that book. Lady Aura told her brother, we are on the last one now. It's a job class promotion item. How do we get the information out of this thing without using it? Lady Aura sent Bushwalker's manual spinning at her brother. Lord Mayor bounced it from palm to palm in a panic several times before catching it. Um. To use promotion items, Lord Mayor said as he clutched the book, you have to fulfill the prerequisites for the class it gives. Does that mean you can access the information safely since you're not a ranger, my lord? Ludmilla asked. That's probably not a good idea, the book in Lord Mayor's hands fell to the ground. Most prestige classes don't require specific job classes as prerequisites. It's just that having certain job classes make it easier to obtain the required prerequisites for certain prestige classes. Ludmilla frowned at the implications of his statement. That sounds hazardous for one's build, my lord. It depends, Lord Mayor said. A lot of prestige classes are beneficial for multiple class archetypes. For instance, 
Big Sis is a ranger and Shizu is a gunner, but they both have sniper. Sniper doesn't specify what sort of ranged weapon you have to use, it's more like a supplementary prestige class that improves a person's long-range combat capabilities. I see, Ludmilla said. Are there any similar prestige classes that I should consider? Your build is tricky, so I'm not really sure. There aren't many captain-like job classes out there and the archetype itself seems to be a local speciality. The only one I can think of that might work is Dragoon. They have good offensive buffs for allies nearby, ah, I think I'm already a Dragoon. Why you are? The non-caster officers of the Imperial Air Service refer to themselves as Dragoons, Ludmilla said. I appear to share many of the same abilities. What have you been using to differentiate your advancement in Dragoon from your other job classes? They have the ability to fall from great heights without taking damage, so I periodically check to see how far I can fall before I hurt myself. Lord Mayor and Lady Aura exchanged a look. That probably doesn't work for you, Lord Mayor told her. If my lord is referring to my damage reduction as a revenant, I do account for it. No. It's just that full damage thresholds are calculated using a variety of athletic skills. Jump, acrobatics, tumbling, rangers have all of that. Why you've seen big sis jump down from high places, right? She had, but no one had ever mentioned that rangers could mitigate full damage so she had simply assumed that the damage was negligible relative to her health. At the same time, no one in the region was crazy enough to find out how far they could fall before breaking their bones. Then what about the dragoons in the Imperial Air Service? Ludmilla asked, they all agree that being a dragoon allows them to free fall from great heights without taking damage. I've seen them perform many such feats firsthand. Dragoons have access to the safe fall passive skill, Lord Mayor answered. It's significantly more effective than the other thing I was talking about. What I meant to say before was that any changes in harmless fall heights may not necessarily come from gaining Dragoon levels. If you get any small increases, those should come from something else. Ludmilla produced a small notebook from her infinite haversack and leafed through it to find her personal falling records. The greater the distance one fell, the more damage they took, so her ability to avoid falling damage felt like it would provide useful options for personal combat. Since she now knew that rangers could do it too, she would have to start throwing her trainees off of cliffs to check on their progress. Based on my records, Ludmilla said, I've only gained one dragoon level and four other levels since I started recording my full heights. Since I made that erroneous assumption, what else are dragoons supposed to do? They are basically mounted heavy infantry, Lord Mayor told her. They are not a real rider archetype, but they still have some cool cavalry skills. She flipped to a blank page in her notebook. Such as? Pretty much the stuff needed for them to succeed at their role, Lord Mayor said. They are heavy shock troops, so they have defensive skills that allow their mounts and themselves to smash enemy formations. Their qualities also make them excellent raiders and rapid response units. That should be especially true around here since almost no one uses dedicated aerial forces. The dragoons of the empire have fully embraced that aspect of their role, Ludmilla nodded. Overall, it's considered a glamorous, high-profile assignment even without imperial propaganda. What else do they do? That's already a lot for one job class, Lord Mayor said. Especially since it's only first bracket prestige class. There's a whole line of even higher bracket dragoon classes, but I'm not sure if that's something you want. I should still find out what I can about them. Do you know of any other options, my lord? MMH, I can think of one other off the top of my head, but it's a racial prestige class for dwarves. If you work hard, I bet you can manifest captain classes that other people have already figured out. What about the weapon master thing that you've been agonizing over? Lady Aura asked. Ludmilla shifted uncomfortably on her blanket. I know that the Adventurer Guild staff considers me a weapon master and I've often thought of myself as one, Ludmilla said, but must it be the case? As far as I can tell, every class in my build contributes to my focus pool for martial arts. I it's not so much your martial arts capacity as it is everything else, Lord Mayor said. 
You act as a weapon master and everyone can see that. There's also your understanding of martial arts. The Adventurer Guild veterans say that only weapon masters have that. I'd rather we not resort to such vague measures for something so important. Is there an aspect of weapon masters that we can quantify through experimentation? Ah, you're better at wielding your weapon? We can't test that unless we have a copy of you without weapon master, though. The most showy thing is that weapon masters score critical hits more often and their critical hit multiplier is higher, but you probably don't have enough levels in the job class for that yet. What is a critical hit multiplier, my lord? It's the damage multiplier for a critical hit, Lord Mayor told her. Most of the popular weapons around here only do double damage on a critical, but they score critical hits more often. Weapons like glaives and longbows do triple, as do axes and hammers. Scythes do quadruple, but I haven't seen anyone use one as a weapon yet. A anyway, those stories where you hear about strong people getting one-shotted by their opponent are likely describing a weapon master. It's why Mr. Kokaitis combos are so deadly, even against pure tanks like Albedo. Ludmilla pursed her lips, silently staring into the fire. The perks of being a weapon master did seem attractive, but that might have been because she was showing her bias as a weapon master. Uh, are you going to kill yourself? Lord Mayor asked. I thought I would easily be able to in any case, Ludmilla answered, but this is an unexpectedly difficult decision. If I am a weapon master, then it must be the result of my training as a child. The combat school passed down to me is a piece of my heritage and I am loath to abandon it. Weren't you just talking about not clinging to the past? Lady Aura said. I didn't say that one must discard their past, my lady, Ludmilla replied. It would be foolish to cast aside the accumulated work of our forebears. Well, maybe it's not such a bad thing, Lady Aura offered a supportive smile. If it doesn't work out, we can always kill you later. It'll be a good experiment, Lord Mayor said. Commanders usually have good stats and special abilities to enhance their allies, but they're poor at personal combat. Going into the weapon master line would make a commander suboptimal, but the captain archetype is a completely new thing. We don't have enough information to definitively say what's good or bad for captain builds, but it's not completely wasted since captains see plenty of personal combat. Unless it's something like Taylor, Lady Aura said. Comma, is there a Captain Taylor build? I don't think so. She could see the benefits of being a weapon master as a captain. In fact, it made perfect sense for her circumstances. Much like tribal demi-human lords, martial nobles were human lords who tended to be the strongest combatants around. Being able to defeat the strongest enemies came first, as one's home and people would be stolen away without that capability. Training one's people to fight effectively was just as important. Leadership was a luxury relative to that, but was that the case any longer? Though she thought its appearance premature, the rise of the civilian aristocracy in re likely represented the natural development of leader-type job classes. When a civilization advanced to a certain stage, its leaders were better positioned as force multipliers for domestic affairs. So long as strong institutions evolved out of their tribal iterations, matters of security could be handled without needing to rely so heavily on singularly powerful individuals. This was certainly the case in the Sorcerer's Kingdom. Her personal strength was nothing compared to so many of the Sorcerer King's vassals and trying to catch up to them felt futile. As far as contributions to the country went, her friends accomplished so much more than she did. In a way, she herself recognized how unnecessary martial nobles were in the sorcerer's kingdom. She was training rangers and commanders from the common population to fill essential roles in the army, she didn't train any martial nobles. At best, martial nobles made for good military governors and even the necessity of that was in question. Ludmilla Zaradnik fought a desperate struggle to prove herself useful in a situation where she suspected that she was already obsolete. She tried to stay positive about it, but her visit to Nazarick made her painfully aware of how far behind she was in everything, and that was with the kind assistance of the sorcerer king and his vassals. On the subject of weapon masters, Ludmilla said. Would levels in the job class be of any use to conventional rangers? The ones training under me, 
For instance, based on the data we've collected from the Adventurer Guild, Lord Mayor said, probably not. Almost all of our members hit a wall by level 20 and there's no reason to think it won't be the same for everyone else. That's not enough levels to work with to create a good build using Weapon Master, at least not for the role that you're training your rangers for. In what way would they work under those level restrictions? MMH, as a damage dealer, I think. For example, you could have someone with 5 levels in Ranger, 10 levels in Longbow Master, and 5 levels in Sniper. As far as local standards go, a company of those could slaughter entire armies, but they won't be anywhere near as good at acting in force reconnaissance roles as a full ranger build. It's honestly better to have archers or gunners instead of rangers with that build if you want a pure ranged damage dealer. I see. Then another question, who can become a weapon master? It feels like anyone can become one the way you've described them. Um, that's because they can, Lord Mayor said. Even a magic caster can become a weapon master if they meet the prerequisites. There are a bunch of prestige classes that multiple archetypes can benefit from. Elementalist would be another example. It's a class that offers elemental mastery, so anyone who can work with the elements may benefit from it. It doesn't matter if they're a wizard or druid or cleric or something else. In the case of the weapon master, Ludmilla said, can the skills and martial arts that they develop be passed on to any job class? Lord Mayor put on a troubled look as he considered her question. That's hard to say, he said after a few moments. Didn't you mention that how one learns martial arts is dependent on their martial foundations? I believe that it is a crucial factor, my lord, Ludmilla replied. Comparing the progress of the Adventurer Guild's members seems to prove the notion. A small handful of adventurers had chosen to learn the use of polearms under Ludmilla, while another small handful had adopted the use of shield and warhammer under Alessia. Another much larger group was learning swordsmanship under Guildmaster Einsack and Mocknich. The rangers trained under Merry and everyone else didn't have a master, the results were telling. Those who trained under Guildmaster Einsack and the former members of Rainbow, who were in the process of establishing a fencing school for the guild, did better than those who had to learn independently. The members who trained under Lud Miller and Alessia, who were both considered weapon masters of their respective combat schools, progressed the fastest by far. So you're proposing that weapon masters can also serve as instructors, Lord Mayor said. I was also considering doing the same for the base in Warden's Vale. Our institutions are still sorely lacking in many of the things that they need to function. Raw power is the main factor keeping us afloat. Is there something wrong with that? Lady Aura asked. It's not always the best nor the most efficient path to take, Ludmilla answered. In the case of the Adventurer Guild, it avails its members nothing. Our expeditions do not employ the Royal Army, after all. For such powerful individuals, it was probably difficult to understand. Additionally, as maturely as they acted, they were still children. It would still be a while before they were old enough to have a proper debate over the topic. So, Ludmilla said, how can we safely obtain the information from this book and others like this? The best bet to keep them from being accidentally consumed is to have someone with a build as far away from the class as possible read it. For this bushwalker's guide, maybe one of the librarians. The elder liches in your territory would work, too. And what shall I do if we want them to be consumed? It felt as if they were more worried about that than anything else. Were the books so precious that they weren't to be used in any circumstance? If one is to become a bushwalker, Ludmilla said, they need to use that book, do they not? Not really. Not really? The answer didn't make much sense. Wasn't the tome the key to obtaining the job class? I'm afraid I don't understand, my lord, Ludmilla said. I don't intend to use the book for myself, but shouldn't a suitable candidate use it at some point? They don't need it, Lord Mayor told her. But, weapon masters have a book too. So do dragoons. Did Lord Irons give you those books? No, my lord. But what does that mean? What does it sound like? Last Aura said, you people don't need these books to gain more advanced job classes. 
you might not even need them to evolve into a higher form of your racial class line. E-evolve? What did they mean by that? Was she going to wake up one day with a pair of wings? No, as an undead being, she was more likely to wake up ethereal. Clara wouldn't be very happy about that. Un. Lady Aura grinned, evolve. I wonder how many limbs you'll have in a few years. I'd rather not have an evolution like that, my lady, Ludmilla said. Surely they aren't such an extreme thing. Albedo has imp racial class levels. Imp as in the imps that the elder liches employ? Yup. From what she had seen, Lady Albedo was shorter than Ludmilla was, but only by about half a head. She didn't have a tail of any sort, either. Furthermore, Lady Shiltier mentioned that Lady Albedo was at least five times as massive as Lord Kokaitis. That was far more extreme than waking up with a new pair of wings. Was it possible that Lady Aura was joking around? Just in case, she would have to observe the Prime Minister more closely during her arena matches. This world truly has terrors beyond comprehension. Gaining job class levels unknowingly. Evolving unwillingly. It would be better if we needed books. Ludmilla looked up through the branches of the twins' home, wondering what would become of her. The sun, or whatever it was, had climbed far overhead. She wasn't sure when the afternoon's tournament match was, but it was probably unwise to linger any longer. We should make our way over to the arena, Ludmilla said. Thank you for setting aside the time to entertain my queries. I have one last question, if I may. Sure, Lady Aura shrugged off her blanket and rose to her feet, what is it? Those who fulfill the prerequisites for one of these books risk consuming them, is that correct? That's right, Lord Mayor said. What about those who already have the job class that the book gives? Lord Mayor stared down at the tome near his feet. I I don't know, Lord Mayor admitted. But it wouldn't make much sense if they were consumed. Ludmilla brushed the leaves off of her dress and doused their campfire. She knew exactly what she would be doing on her next visit to Ashabonapole.